The story begins with a young man called Suho texting with his mother. Suho, just like anyone of his age, likes to hang out with his friends, but today he won't be able to because he has to attend a birthday party against his will. Mistakenly, he bumps into someone and gets scolded by a complete stranger. Suho apologizes, but inside he feels disgusted for facing humiliation. Suho tries to shift his mind to the current problem, but suddenly a lightning strike strikes down the city and pierces through it, causing mass destruction and chaos everywhere. But it was just the first, and then the whole sky got filled with lightning, ready to destroy the whole city and in a matter of seconds, it happened. Suho doesn't realize what's happening, all he can see at the moment is people dying everywhere. He tries to save himself by running as fast as he can, but suddenly he sees a truck a moment away from taking his life. To his surprise, Suho wakes up, but he himself doesn't know where he is because all he sees is the night sky, two moons, and some creatures he has never witnessed in his entire life. He finds himself naked in a completely different world. He doesn't know how he got here or who brought him, there are many questions but no answer. But before his mind could understand the situation, a bear was ready to take his life, but Suho once again survives through a miracle. This time, it was the wolves who brutally hunted the bear, which is something Suho has never seen in his life. It's all a reality, but he can't believe his eyes, it's too much to be true. In comparison, none of it really matters because all that matters is survival, so Suho runs as fast as his body can go. He doesn't know where he will end up, but he knows he has to run. Out of nowhere, he hears a voice that tells him that his constitution has increased by one. The voices catch him off guard, which makes him fall to the ground. Suho tries to pick himself up, and his body feels hunger. He finds himself surrounded by fruits, but he has doubts about their edibility. After all, it's not his world, so he can't be sure about anything. He tries to resist, but then he takes a bite out of it. Before he could eat it, he heard a sound. It's a wild forest, so every sound is no less than a warning for him. Behind the grass is someone who is ready to take Suho's life, and before he could move an inch, a giant snake made the first move. The snake's jaw is ready to take the life of Suho, but due to the turns of events, the predator becomes the prey of someone who is above him in the food chain. In the last few minutes, Suho almost lost his life twice in this mysterious place, and he isn't sure how long he will actually survive here, after all, miracles can't happen every time. He has to gain skills and knowledge to survive, because every day at this place is a competition, and only the worthy will survive. 66 days pass by, and Suho is still alive, barely surviving because a pack of wolves is behind him all the time. He believes they will never stop chasing him until he's alive. He knows this is how his life is now, so the only smart decision is to develop himself continuously. One year has passed, and Suho has upgraded himself very much since the first day. Now he can lift heavy things, which helps him get the food. Suho acquires a banana, and this will be his food for the day, but wolves still haven't left him alone, especially a white one who just can't take his eyes off him. He eats the banana, but suddenly he feels something, and when he turns his eyes, he sees a gorilla marching towards him. Now it's a battle of death, but Suho has gained experience in the last year, so he won't need a miracle this time to survive and save himself. The gorilla falls from the tree due to its enormous size. After falling down, gorilla realizes that it almost killed a wolf, who is now seeking revenge on it. Just like any predator of the wild, gorilla doesn't like that a weaker animal is standing up. The gorilla screams to scare the wolf off, but the wolf is in the mood to run away. The gorilla attacks the wolf, but it wasn't enough to take its life, so it has to strike again. But before that, Suho interferes and stabs the gorilla's eye, making it go more insane than before. The wolf runs away, but Suho can't. Now he has to face a gorilla more angry than ever, ready to take his life. But before that, Suho wakes back up in the real world, surrounded by the doctors. He is telling them his story and trying to explain his wild experiences. Even though doctors don't really believe his story of two moons and giant creatures, something about the story sparks their interest. The doctor asks him why he tried to pick up a fight with Gorilla if he already knew he couldn't stand it. But Suho tells them the nature of fighting, why one can't become stronger or more powerful without defeating someone more powerful, and why no matter where you go, there's always a ruler. On the other side, Gorilla is completely ready to kill Suho, but to his surprise, the white wolf attacks the gorilla to save him. He refuses to believe what he saw, that the same animal who wanted to kill him since last year is now saving him, ready to sacrifice his own life in the process. Instantly, the whole group attacks the gorilla, and Suho gets shocked because the same wolves who wanted to kill him are now saving him. He falls unconscious, but the wolves don't attack because the pup he saved was the son of the king. The wolf honors his gesture. The year passes, and those who were enemies become friends. Suho joined the group of wolves, and they accepted him like he was one of them. Suho doesn't feel alone anymore, even though they were animals and yet the first to accept him in this world. We move to the 31st year of Suho, and now he's completely different from what he used to be. 
A scared, weak boy has turned into a fierce warrior who isn't afraid of taking down large snakes. He is also ready to do everything for his family, the wolves. Together with them, he hunts down a boar, which wasn't a big task for them. Years go by, but Suho fails to find another human like him in this strange world. He made many new companions in the form of wolves and lost many too. At the beginning, he thought he wouldn't be able to survive a day in this wild place, but now he's still standing, stronger than ever, even after hundreds of years. The doctor finds his story the most interesting he has ever heard because no human can live for 500 years and become king of the wolves. The doctors then ask him the most important question, how he returned. Suho then narrates the story of how he started a war on gorillas over Moonlight Hill. The wolves, led by Suho, were ready to claim the biggest victory of their lives. The battle began, and everyone started to brutally kill each other. Suho knew who his target was, and it was the king gorilla. He knew if he killed it, it would be over instantly, so he went straight for its life. Just before the mere second Suho could claim the victory, something strange happened, and he left the world without a trace. On Earth, we see some guys roaming in the abandoned and destroyed city, looking for something. Suddenly, their device tells them that something is happening, which might be the thing they want to see. Everyone starts to run away because the portal is opening. A girl with a sword in her hand gets ready to take on anyone who comes out of the portal. The portal opens, and it's none other than the Suho. The enormous energy surrounding him shows that a portal has opened, and in a matter of seconds, it closes itself again. What's left is Suho lying naked on the ground. Everyone doesn't think it's unusual, as they call him another returner. And the next time Suho opened his eyes, he was in a hospital with a doctor who recorded his testimony for the Awaken a Bureau. He tells Suho that he is fine and will be discharged in a few days. The doctor then proceeds to leave, but Suho stops him, and when the doctor asks him what's the matter, he replies with a smile and says thanks to him because he was the first human he talked to in thousands of years. The doctor smiles back, saying his information will be very helpful. On the other hand, at the Awaken a Bureau headquarters, we see the same girl who almost killed Suho with her boss. They talk about a rare F-rank patient who is none other than Suho. The boss explains that if he were an E-rank patient, the government would have provided him benefits. The girl wonders how a F managed to go through a portal. The chief explains it could be pure luck for him. He then shows the report of the doctors who talked to Suho. The report clearly mentions that Suho behaves like a wolf and is suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, which is common among first responders. The girl decides to deliver this report in person because she wants to confirm something about him. At the hospital, Suho is still lost in his thoughts, how he spent thousands of years in that strange world and his sudden return to the earth. Even though he has been back for about two weeks now, he is still struggling to get together there. He wants to go back to that beautiful, wild world with his companions. He once again wants to experience that adventurous life filled with dangers everywhere, but at the end of the day, he liked being there. The nurse comes in and informs him that it's time for lunch. Suho too feels hungry, so he delays his deep thoughts and decides to eat. Awaken a bureau girl enters his room and finds him in a very strange position. The girl introduces herself as Choi Su Young. Suho immediately senses and identifies her smell, and with the help of her blonde hair, he remembers that he has seen her somewhere. She then explains that she's the first person he saw when he returned from the portal. She also remembers the predatory look in his eyes when he returned. But now he's a completely different person. He doesn't seem as dangerous as before. Suho then asks her what the Awaken a Bureau is. She explains that it's an organization that helps returnees like Suho readjust to society. She then asks him to sign the consent for sharing information, but Suho finds the pen more interesting than the contact itself. After all, he holds a pen after thousands of years. He even forgot what to do with it as he started to draw a wolf on it. Suung is annoyed by this behavior, even though she knows he is a student, and she can't stand his behavior. She asks him if he can learn to draw, but he explains he already knows how to draw. She expected such an answer, but then she asks him what he actually learned there. Suho explains that there was no magic or sorcery in that world. Survival was all about physical strength and intelligence. Choi feels disappointed because she believes Suho did nothing useful there for 10 years. He then tries to correct that it's not 10 years but thousands of years he spent there, but she reminds him that he went missing in 2015 and has now returned in 2025. She then hands him his Awaken ID card which provides personal and important information about him. She also suggests he meet up with his family soon. After hearing about his family, Suho gets a new purpose for his life. He thought his family was long gone, but now that they are alive, he can finally see them. Suho also comes to the realization that even though he got his real family back, he also lost his forest family, with whom he spent thousands of years and now probably he will see them again. He checks the report and sees that both his dad and mother died on that day, which only leaves his brother Junho alive. He immediately jumps out of bed and rushes to meet the doctor. Suho then asks the doctor for a favor, to which the doctor replies, What help can I give? 
He then tells the doctor that his little brother is still alive and that he immediately needs to meet with him. The doctor then tries to calm him down because he isn't ready to get back into society after all. After all, it's been only two weeks since his return. Suho was in no mood to take advice and he replies in his ruthless voice to the doctor that he isn't asking for his permission, but ordering him to help. The doctor, too, decides not to annoy him anymore. He agrees to help, but only under one condition. Later, we see Suho in a taxi, ready to leave the hospital. Dr. Baldi, as Suho calls him, warns the taxi driver about Suho's condition. Suho leaves as a doctor, and his nurse watches him. She then asks the doctor the reason for his generosity. After all, the doctor paid for all his medical bills, bought him new clothes, and even hired a taxi for him. What's the reason for a filthy rag like him? The doctor tells her that Suho might be a Frankenstein, and the government doesn't give a damn about him, but his story is still far more interesting than any story he has ever heard. The doctor still wants to hear his story and knows more about his experience and adventure in that mysterious world. When they go back to the doctor's room, he asks the nurse to get the broken handle repaired. She shockingly asks him how it happened. Suho was the one who caused this. He returned to the normal world, but maybe his strength, which he acquired with thousands of years of experience, is still with him. This is important for the doctor because it could be proof of how authentic the story actually is. After all, this is only the second time the door handle has broken. On the other side, Suho is stuck in traffic, and on his car's radio, he hears news about the attack of the monsters. Monsters were rampaging through the entire city and causing mass destruction. The defense ministry sent the forces, and the situation is now under control. They were successful in taking down the monster, but suffered casualties. Then the radio host talks about the SBFC Championship, a tournament between the Awakers to find out who is best. World Rank 34, the Russian bear is up against the World Rank 48, Beyond Horizon, and the winner will face the current number one from Japan. Suho finds it interesting, but he doesn't know what this is all about. The driver seems excited about it, like it's not something unusual for him. Suho remembers how the doctor told him that the world has changed a lot, but he didn't expect something this big. The driver then shares his wish to start hunting, but he's not an awakener, so he's just stuck with his boring job. Suho asks, in confusion, what he is talking about because there are no hunting grounds in Seoul. The driver finds it dumb, but he had no idea that Suho had been absent for the last 10 years. Suho asks him to tell him everything about it, and driver, being bored, agrees. The story goes back 10 years, when a door to a different world opened, not just in Korea but in the entire world. That unfortunate day is known as the Day of the Great Disaster. That day, the Earth got connected to many different worlds, and the monsters raided the Earth. It was so disastrous that 10% of the entire human population died in a single day. Governments of every country deployed armies to counter those monsters, but against their strength, armies stand no chance. People who disappeared during the Great Disaster were later known as the Awakenas, and they were given licenses to be mercenaries. The job was to kill these monsters in exchange for money. Slowly, this turned into a full-time business, and mercenaries started to form guilds. Life without mercenaries became impossible because they were the only ones who could counter the monsters. Suho finds the concept of a mercenary very interesting. After all, he was a mighty warrior in the other world who raged wars on many races. He asks the driver how one can become a mercenary. The driver laughs it off and explains it's impossible for an ordinary human. Only Awakeners can become mercenaries, and for that, they have to pass the mercenary examination at the Awakeners Bureau. Suho carefully listens to the driver because he wants to become a mercenary, but the idea of giving an examination seems complicated to him. Last time, when he was a fighter, it wasn't his job but his way of life. Finally, the taxi driver shows him the house he was supposed to drop him off at. He drops Suho there, and now Suho can finally meet a family member after 10 years. He feels nervous before entering the building. Suddenly, an old woman notices him outside and begins to stare at him. Suho doesn't realize what's going on, so to break the silence, he asks her if she knows Junho. This question immediately enrages her, and she starts to abuse him. She releases all her frustration and tells him that no one lives here by that name. Suho couldn't say a word before the woman shut down her window. He starts to wonder if it's the wrong address. Before he could leave, he suddenly heard the voice of a kid called Gunwoo. The kid and the old woman talk about money lenders who harass them daily. Suho then checks their mailbox and sees that his brother is in debt. He slowly starts to go away and begins to wonder what true power is because the world where he spent his last 10 years was all about strength. 
Now that he has returned to the normal world, money triumphs over everything. Money is the true power. This makes him completely determined to become a mercenary, so he goes to the Awakena Bureau. Upon arrival, Suho's application gets rejected because he doesn't match the requirements. He objects how can this be possible because he is a freak and returned to Earth two weeks ago. The receptionist explains to him that most people die when the portal opens, and they just can't let anyone become a hunter. The reason Suho can't give the exam is because he is four Awakena points short. She suggests he join Awakena school or increase points manually, but until then he can't give the examination. The process gets more complicated for Suho to become a mercenary. On his way out, he notices a bounty poster, which catches his attention. The name of the monster is written as Suwon Fields Goblins. While in the taxi, he asks the driver why there are so many walls around the city, and the driver explains that the entire Seoul city is covered by these walls and is divided into 12 areas, and there are many gates to travel through. Finally, the taxi driver drops Suho at gate 27. He isn't nervous or scared at all before entering the hunting grounds. Two military guards stop him before he can enter and ask him what his business is here. Suho replies with just one word, hunting. The guards then asked him to show his mercenary license. Suho explains he got none, and before they could ask him to go back, suddenly an emergency happens. A car with a monster on it comes out of hunting ground and crashes outside. Every guard then in a formation begins to shoot at it and kills it. They then look around and find that Suho is not there anymore, and they believe he has run away. Suho, on the other side, starts to make preparations for everything he will need, like a car and a smartphone. He will require these things for hunting. The sun sets and the sky turns blue, which brings back many memories for Suho. He then tests his physical skills and realizes that he hasn't lost them. They are still with him after he spent thousands of years acquiring them. He's now clear of his goal to become a mercenary, and soon he discovers some monsters surrounding an alone animal. He decides that this is the perfect moment to test his skills and see if he's capable of taking the lives of monsters to protect mankind. Suho then attacks and kills them brutally, just like he used to fight against the monsters of the other world. Suddenly a screen pops up in front of him with a message written as searching for your class. Suddenly, the many screens surrounded Suho like he was playing some sort of game. He doesn't know what's happening or what this system error is about. The monsters attack him, thinking he's distracted, but this turns out to be their worst mistake as he kills them all with very little effort. Another message pops up saying system error, transferring druid, failed to reset stats. Suho doesn't realize what he has failed at, but suddenly he remembers that he used to hear these messages in the other world. But after a while, when he maxed out his physical abilities, he stopped leveling up. Suho never thought this system would be on Earth too, and then he obtains an achievement. Suho never obtained any achievement, and he believes this is his awakening. We can see he has a total of 7 points, and he can buy items with these points. Suho decides to use these points, and suddenly bread and water appear in front of him. Then he notices the dog he just saved, but it's dying and the puppy can't see it. He feels pity for the dog who dies in front of him and asks him to take care of the puppy. Suho then looks into the innocent eyes of the puppy, whose mother just died, so he decides to take it as his companion. Suho then sees that he killed a total of seven monsters. Night passes and morning comes, and Suho and the puppy pay their final tribute to the female dog. At gate 27, everyone is waiting for it to open, and suddenly Suho arrives there with all the monsters he has killed. The same guards who were doubting his capability are now in shock. How can someone so casually kill them all and bring it here? Suho then goes to the counter to receive his money. He receives money for killing goblins and collecting blood crystals. He receives $2,100 in cash because he doesn't have an account yet, and the receptionist also suggests that he get registered. Suho curiously asks her about the blood crystals and learns that they were inside the goblins and can be sold for $200 each. Suho finds it profitable, because now he can easily make money doing what he is best at, hunting. After that, we see a store and a man talking to the shop owner about his new job as a truck driver, and this man is none other than Suho's brother, Junho. The shop owner is happy for him because his new job will help him deal with his financial troubles. On his way back, Money confronts Junho and smashes him to the ground. They ask him where he is because they were unable to find him at his house. They beat him up because he hasn't paid the money he borrowed. Junho then hands over $2,240 to him for the month's principal amount and the interest. But the money lender doesn't like this gesture and hits him again because, according to him, he's still short of the amount he has to pay. Junho begins to cry because he feels helpless and asks for forgiveness. He also pledges to return all the money within the given time. But they continue to beat him up until a voice stops them. They all look in the direction from which the voice came, and we see Suho in his angriest mood marching towards them. Junho identifies his brother immediately. Suho continues to walk towards them with rage in his eyes, then gets down and asks his brother if he's parked Junho to confirm. 
Then we see a flashback before the day of the great disaster. Even in the flashback story, it isn't different, some people are beating up Junho in school. He's still helpless, but he suddenly sees his brother nearby, so he calls for help. Surprisingly, Suho doesn't even react, and he doesn't even look back when Junho cries for help. Perhaps he doubts his ability because this was before he became a warrior in the wild. Junho realizes how useless his brother is. On the day of the great disaster, Junho was watching TV when suddenly emergency news was broadcast about a giant explosion. He realizes his brother is not home yet, so he rushes to the door but gets stopped by his aunt and uncle. They feel a little better when they discover Junho is home. Junho tells them about his parents, but even they have no idea where they are. He then mentions that Suho isn't home yet, but suddenly a giant explosion destroys their building. When Junho picks himself up, he sees a big eye of a monster looking at him, and since that day, he hasn't cared if his brother is alive or dead, they never really had a good relationship to care about it. Now we turn back to the present, where Junho is still shocked after seeing his brother. Suho calmly jokes about how old he has become, even though he's his younger brother. Junho, still in shock, asks why he's still alive and well. But their conversation is interrupted by the money lender, who believes that both of them are mentally ill. This annoys Suho, and he can't stand someone insulting his brother anymore, so he grabs his head and smashes it to the ground. This was an example of his new strength, which Junho has never seen. The second one tries to take him on, but Suho stops his kick in midair, and within a second he snaps his leg. This was a horrific scene to witness for the third one, so he starts to beg for mercy and tells him he didn't even touch his brother. Suho then gives him all of his money, which he earned by hunting monsters. The money lender gets his money, and then they both start to go away. When they arrive at Junho's apartment, Suho again meets the same granny who rudely told him to go away, but this time her behavior is different because now she knows he's Junho's brother. They go inside, and Junho introduces his sleeping son Gunwoo to Suho. He tells him that his son is now the most important thing for him, and he will do anything for him. Suho asks where the kid's mother is, and Junho tells him that she left the family to live by herself. He blames himself for this because, because of his financial failures, he wasn't able to provide enough. Suho then asks him for a drink so they could both sit together and talk. After all, there are a lot of things to talk about. Junho tells him that he always thought Suho died on the disaster day, and is now returning as an awakener is perhaps the craziest thing that happened. Suho then helps him figure out how much debt he has and finds out it's $50,000. Junho also tells him not to worry about it now because he got a brand new job and now he can pay back all of his debt. Suho asks, what type of job has he got? So Junho tells him that now he works at a store. Suho gets an idea, so he asks him who owns the truck he uses. Junho explains that he doesn't own that truck, but that truck belonged to landowner Granny's son, who died during the great disaster. Now she looks after his son because she believes he's her family. As they were talking, Gunwoo woke up, and to his surprise, he found a dog near him, which immediately cheered him up. He gets even happier when he sees that his dad has returned. He asks Junho about Suho and finds out he's his uncle. He greets him and politely asks him if he could play with his dog. Suho smiles back and says yes. Gunwoo gets cheered up because he always wanted a dog but they couldn't afford one. Suho then shares his idea with his brother. He tells him that he could work with him, and together they will make a lot of money, but it will need Junho's truck. Junho then asks him what he is thinking about. Suho tells him about the monster hunting. The next day, Suho goes to the Awakena Bureau and surprises them by telling them that he leveled himself up in just one day. The receptionist then gives him a smartphone called the X-Phone 50 and suggests he download the Awakena Bureau app for the latest updates and schedule for the mercenary exam. She also explains to him that they are having some problems with the stat screens. Suho confusingly asks her about it. Suddenly, a screen pops up telling the stats of Suho. He sees that he is still on level 1, which explains why he was feeling weak. Now that he has everything he needs, he is ready to power up and go monster hunting. Suho then calls his brother to tell him about it. Junho congratulates him for finally becoming a full-fledged mercenary and wishes him the best for the exam. He tells him he will be there after completing his job. Suho wants to waste no time, so he orders him to come immediately so they can hunt monsters for debt. Junho then reminds her that it's way too early for that because he's just a freak. Suho doesn't like excuses, so he hangs up the phone. Junho realizes his brother has completely changed, it's not the same weak Junho he used to know. Suho starts to look for the nearest hunting ground. A crowd filled with cars is ready to enter hunting grounds. Everyone is not alone, some are with their teams because hunting monsters is no easy task. We see a team of five people preparing to enter the hunting ground. Three members can be seen scared even though they are awakeners, while the two at the front are ready for hunting. 
They try to calm their teammates, and suddenly Suho shows up there. The receptionist asks him for his Awaken ID and lets him in but also warns him not to enter dungeons. Everyone sees how Suho is walking without any weapons or equipment, like he doesn't even care about monsters. The police guards talk about Suho's accomplishments, like how he killed seven goblins at gate 27. The group we met earlier finds Suho interesting, so they decide to chase him, but when they enter the hunting grounds, they lose sight of him. Suho begins to test his abilities by running sprints, he wants to check how far he can push himself in a fight. Suddenly he hears multiple voices, and when he looks, he sees two groups of people sword fighting each other and cutting each other's limbs brutally. Suho sees that there are too many in number and it will take a lot of time to kill them, so he decides not to pursue them and instead look for someone with a higher bounty. Luckily, a guy arrives there with a $40,000 bounty. The name is Choi Gushik. Suho was about to leave, but hearing 40,000 stopped him. He wonders how powerful one has to be for a 40,000 bounty on his head. Those who were sword fighting start to run away seeing Choi because he's a C ranker. Choi then challenges all three, who were fighting for his time for a matchup. But they know they can't stand a chance against the Choi. They begin to negotiate and offer everything if he lets them go, but Choi refuses their offer because he finds it boring to let anyone go. Just one second before Choi could crush them, Suo came in between. Everyone gets shocked because this idiot came out of nowhere and is now standing in front of Choi fearless with not a single sign of worry on his face. Choi asks him who he is and why he came here. Suho ignores his question and in return asks him if he's the guy with the 40,000 bounty. Choi angrily again asks who he is, and Suho replies, someone who is in need of money. Everyone starts to worry about him because no one tries to fight a C ranker for such reasons, and Suho seems just a kid to them. Choi tells him that this is the worst decision he has ever made and that it would have been better for him if he had just stayed away. Suho doesn't even flinch, but suddenly he feels his body freeze and he can't move himself. Choi explains to him that he made a mistake by looking into his eyes for more than 5 seconds, and he can use his powers on him. He then orders his men to crush every single bone in Suho's body, but before that, Suho punches him. Everyone, including Choi, can't understand how he did it because no one can free himself from Choi's power. When Choi looks at Suho's face, he sees something that scares him to his core. He sees Suho's most sinister and evil look, a look of someone who is ready to brutally murder him, and he realizes his biggest mistake ever will now cost him his life. Suho almost hits him, but at the last second, Choi uses his ability and binds Suho, he feels a little better and believes the threat is over. He tells Suho that he knows he is strong, but he can't defeat him. Choi takes his knife to stab him, but once again Suho frees himself and kicks him far away. He tells Choi of his incompetence to have anything besides his bind ability, which is useless against Suho. The other three find it miraculous that someone has defeated Choi so easily. Suho then gets surrounded by Choi's men. Their swords are red with the blood of people they have killed. Suho asks them if they want to fight too. Choi's men find it's their chance to save their lives because it's impossible for them to take him down. They all then beg for mercy and tell him that they have no bounty on their heads. Choi forced them to work for him using his muscle power, and now they can just run away. Suho asks for a rope to tie Choi, and one of those three guys gives it to him. Choi angrily calls his men traitors for betraying him. They reveal that they always hated him, and now it's their chance to get freedom. Choi realizes he can't do it all by himself, so he tries to persuade Suho. He tells him that if he lets him go, he will do everything in his power to make Suho king of the city. He believes Suho will agree to his terms, but in return, Suho kicks him so badly he falls unconscious. Now Suho once again asks Choi's men for their bounty, and they still tell him that they are useless and that killing them will do no good. But the three hunters reveal to Suho that every single one of Choi's men is a criminal and has a bounty on their heads. Suho then decides to hunt them too for some extra cash. Later the three hunters help Suho with their car and thank him. Suho reveals he wasn't there to help them at all. He then asks them what their special power is. The leader reveals he became a sword fighter after awakening and learned some other skills via book. Suho gets surprised that you can learn skills from books, so he decides that he will learn extra things from them. They find it weird that Suho is so strong yet he doesn't know about the skill books. Out of curiosity, he asks Suho what his level is, and when he reveals that he's just a F ranker, everyone gets shocked because how can a mere rookie F ranker hunt down a C ranker? Suho then asks them about the portal, and they reveal it's a level 1 dungeon, and only high profile and strong mercenaries are allowed to visit it. They wanted to go there, but their strength wasn't enough for that. Suho then asks them about the favor they wanted to ask because he's ready to help them. Then we see Captain Kang and his team coming out of a portal, feeling frustrated. 
His team is badly injured, and this makes him angry because he doesn't want to work with amateurs and crybabies. He shouts at them to stop being such crying babies. He then promises to get them fired because the Awakena Bureau doesn't need idiots who can't even protect themselves. His partner then calms him down and reminds him how the current system works. Rich and privileged parents use their influence to make their kids hunters. They hire professional mercenaries to kill monsters on behalf of their kids and train them. While the kid becomes a mercenary with the help of his parents' money, he still gains no good skills and remains a burden on his teammates. Captain finds it unfair that even in this profession, rich people can bypass effort and time quickly while normal people have to face consequences. Captain Kang then asks the guards there if something happened today, and he finds out someone delivered 10 ravagers, including a C-rank boss named Choi. Kang gets shocked that a C-ranker has been defeated, so he asks which high-ranking mercenary did it. The guards then reveal that it wasn't a high-ranking person who did all of this but just a noob. F ranker, that fighter was so strong that he fractured multiple ribs of Choi, which is pretty difficult because of Choi's ability. Kang then immediately remembers Suho and believes he's the one who caused all of this. He instantly asks the guard where this F ranker went. The guards tell him the last time they saw him was when he entered the portal. It was enough information for him, so then Captain Kang runs to enter the portal because he wants to witness Suho's strength with his own eyes. Captain Kang then asks the operator which door the Suho used to enter the portal. On the other side, Suho has already entered the portal with new clothes, and he likes them. He finds out that normal clothes can't enter portals due to dimensional energy, but these special clothes can. They are expensive but do the job. Suho then notices something different, so he asks what that thing is. His partner explains that it's the door. Doors are the pathways that let hunters enter 38 different dungeons, and the door they just used was number 24. Suddenly the door gets disappeared, and Suho asks what happened. He finds out that the door won't show up again until they clear the dungeon. Suho then asks him what clearing dungeons means. Does it mean killing every single monster because it will take a lot of time and Suho is the last guy who wants to spend so much time in it? His partner explains to him that they just have to kill the strongest one to open the door. This energizes Suho because he has developed an urge to hunt down the strongest. He then immediately goes straight to find the strongest monster because he's excited to kill it. His partner, on the other hand, realizes something is not right because Suho has no tracking skills, so what if he gets lost? If that happens, they will both be wiped out with the dimension. He knows this is a serious issue, so he begins to search for him. We then see monsters of the dimension, they are big and fierce, looking for something to kill. Suddenly they hear a voice, and before one of them could look back, Suho kicks him to death. He then begins to kill every one of them brutally, with no mercy. After piercing their bodies, he discovers one blood crystal, which can be sold for profit. He leaves the place to discover the big one, but when his partner arrives there, he sees a lot of goblins dead on the ground, and the scene looks like a massacre. Suho obtains skill points by killing so many goblins that he can now use them to acquire skills. He sees a lot of options but decides to summon the tree spirit. The tree spirit summons Suho remembers it from his other world's experience. He then orders the tree spirit to go look for more goblins. Tree spirits can communicate with him via trees and grass because they're all connected. He then checks that stat screen and discovers he has leveled up. His achievement count is 345. He then sees an option to search and track, which will help in hunting. He uses his remaining point to buy both of these skills because he knows their importance. He begins to use the search skill to mark the entire place, and then, with the help of the tracking skill, he finally discovers something that is not a goblin. It's something powerful and stronger, a perfect target for him. Without wasting any time, he arrives at the place for the battle, but he sees that his partner is already battling with the monster but struggling to gain the upper hand. Suho shouts at him because he told him to stay at the door's place and not hunt alone. He tells Suho that he isn't hunting but getting hunted. The monster ignores their conversation and all its focus is on slaughter. He tries to stab, but Suho immediately kicks him away. Before it could stand up again, Suho kicks it so hard that the entire body gets covered in blood. Suho gives it no chance to run away or to counterattack. He strikes at it one after another and finally takes his life. Suho instantly levels up and acquires 120 points, while his partner is still in shock because maybe he has never seen such a ruthless hunter. Suho then asks him if the door will open now or not because he finds no problem in hunting someone more powerful, but this kill was already enough to open the door. Their job is done, so they both return via the portal, and everyone watches them in surprise. One guard remembers that Captain Kang asked him to remind him if that farrier returns. Hunam then excuses himself because he wants to meet with his team. He also thanks Suho one last time for his incredible help. After changing clothes, when Suho arrives outside, he meets Captain Kang. 
who is standing there excited to meet him. The captain then asks him if he's Park Suho and introduces himself as Captain Kang Min Yoke, the captain of the 27th combat team of the Shilla Guild. He asks Suho for a few minutes and they both go to a bar to talk in private. Kang then offers him the chance to join the Shilla Guild and promises to provide a good working environment for him. Suho refuses in a second, which makes Kang angry, but he hides it. He then asks Suho if he's associated with another guild, and if that's the case, then they will submit an official offer to his guild. Suho again says he doesn't have a guild and is just working alone. Kang then tries to convince him by mentioning Shilla Guild is ranked 4th and is one of the strongest in the world. He tries to tell Suho how joining the guild can help in many ways, but Suho again refuses the offer because he can't stand working under someone. He knows he's the best, and the best should be the king, not a subordinate. Kang doesn't like his attitude, but he knows there's no other way he could convince him right now. Suho returned home, but Junho and his son weren't there. He thinks they might be spending some father-son time together, which is good for them. He then goes to a rooftop and lays down to rest. Granny then taunts him to stop being lazy because he's young and capable of working. Suho then begins to help the granny. She then asks him once again if he's actually the older brother of Junho because she believes he's aging backwards. Suho jokingly replies that he didn't age backward but reversed it. Granny doesn't understand it, but she believes it because this world has become stranger in the last decade. She then tells him to look after himself because now he has a family to love and care for, and losing a family member is the worst experience in the world. Suho assures her that he can't be killed, but she warns him that the ones who say such things are the ones who die first. Junho and Gunwoo return, and they ask Granny where Suho is. She tells them he's upstairs and waiting for them. Suho then gives Junho an envelope, and when he asks what's in it, Suho tells him it's $50,000 so he can pay all of his debt now. Initially, Suho gets shocked and refuses to take the money because he fears he won't be able to return that amount. He starts to cry because he never thought this day would come. But Suho asks him to stop crying and go. Junho thanks God for such a life-saving favor and leaves to pay off all of his debt. While Gunwoo plays with the dog, Suho checks his screen and sees a message that says that the target is following. Suho doesn't understand what all this is about. Gunwoo then asks him what they will name the dog, and Suho lets him decide. Gunwoo names the dog Biku, and Suho agrees. He also sees Biku's stat screen, which shows he's on level 1. Suho then starts to play with both of them, and just like that, time passes. During the evening, Junho's truck returns, so they both go downstairs to meet him, but to their surprise, they see Junho covered in blood struggling to walk, and suddenly he falls to the ground. Dunwu tries to wake him up, and Suho begins to wonder what happened to his brother. After it, we see a mob in an office. They were all discussing the betting odds for the SBF Championship Tournament when suddenly they hear a big noise outside. The door opens and one of the henchmen tells them they are in trouble, and suddenly he gets snatched behind. Someone is beating up all the mobs, and they start to wonder who it is when they see two eyes in the darkness filled with rage. Those eyes were of Suho, who then lifted a bench with just one hand and threw it at the mobs. He causes a lot of destruction here, and everyone suffers a lot of damage. He then slowly moves ahead towards the boss, who still doesn't know what's happening. Suho then asks him if he's Kim jong Su. He replies with yes that's he's Kim. Suho then tells him that he's here to settle a debt. Kim warns him that he shouldn't attack them if he's an Awakener because the government won't like it. Suho doesn't care about his warning and slaps him so hard that his teeth fall out. He continues to beat him up and tells him he shouldn't have crossed the line by beating his brother up. They all then ask forgiveness from Suho and promise to never harass Junho. Suho then leaves the place without wasting any time. But the boss is still angry for this. He tells his subordinates that he has connections with powerful people and he will definitely take revenge. On the other hand, Captain Kang arrives at the guild headquarters and shows his boss, Mr. Park Suho, his profile. He tells them that he's the best one they could get, but when they both try to look more into his profile, a message pops up saying access is denied. Park finds it shocking and interesting at the same time, so they both hack into the system to check his profile. They get impressed after looking at his stats and can't believe he's just a rookie. Kang then says they should do everything to get this guy, but his boss believes he's actually not a mercenary. They check and find he's been missing for 10 years, which makes them believe he could be a government secret agent. Kang still tries to convince Park, but he refuses, saying it's a waste of time to pursue something they can't attain. Kang then asks for just a weekly report on him, but again, it's rejected. Suho arrives at the hospital to meet his brother. Junho then reminds him that the mercenary exam is tomorrow. Suho tells him that he knows that and is fully prepared. But the idea of working under someone is still not good for him because he used to be the king of the jungle. Junho then tells him that he could search for some high rank guilds for him. But Suho refuses because he's going to form his own guild. We then see Suung again at the Awakena Bureau headquarters. Her boss then scolds her because of two breakouts in her area. She tells him that she's trying her best. 
He then shows her a letter and she gets angry because it's another job letter and she has to go to an exam. Her boss warns her not to reject too many applicants, like always. At the examination center, a lot of applicants are ready to take the exam. We also see a guy live streaming the entire event when Suho crashes his live stream. Then the major, Kim Young Soo, introduces himself. He tells everyone that they will be assigned to one of 21 supervisors. Everyone starts to wish for a good supervisor. Major says that the assignment will be completely random via lottery. The process starts and everyone begins to get their supervisors. The steaming guys, Han dong Su and Suho, get the same supervisor, number 15. Surprisingly, the number 15 is su Wung, and Suho identifies her. Everyone begins to formulate strategies and Suho notices that dong Su is sad. He asks him why he's sad now because just a whole time ago he was very happy. He tells Suho that they are screwed now because that blonde trainer is a witch. She fails everyone because of her own mood and is very rough. Suho tells him that he's just making excuses, which enrages him. Dong Su then asks him to show some respect to his elders. Suho then tells him to settle things like a man and not be a crybaby. Dong Su gets angry because he believes he's stronger, so he challenges Suho to a fight. When Su Wung arrives, she discovers that no one is there and begins to wonder what's happening. On the other side, Suho and Dong Su are in a cage to fight. Dong Su reminds him of what he has done, because he believes he's going to beat him to death. He tells Suho that he's a rising YouTube boxer, and Suho doesn't know what that is. Everyone believes Suho is an idiot, so they start to cheer Dong Su. Dong Su is excited because he believes it will be an easy fight for him. He jokes that he's not going to pay the medical bills. Suho is also ready for the fight because fighting has become an addiction for him. Dong Su then shows his fitness and agility and launches an attack on Suho, but before anything could have happened, Su Young arrives there and stops the fight. She orders everyone to go back, otherwise, she will immediately fail them. Everyone rushes back except Dong Su and Suho. She then asks them if they want to fail after doing such a thing. Dong Su starts to explain that it's not actually his fault, but Su Wung stops him. She tells him that there's no need for explanations because one of them has to take the blame. She then asks both to continue their fight and the loser will be eliminated. Dong Su feels nervous because it's too much to put on the line, but Suho is all ready for the battle like he was just waiting for it. Dong Su sees Suho coming towards him and he warns him about it but Suho doesn't care. Dong Su takes a stance and tries to attack Suho, but instead Suho hits him back, and his punch was so strong that Dong Su falls unconscious. Su Wung waits, but nothing happens, and she assumes it's safe to believe that Dong Su ain't going to wake up very soon, and Suho's smile says it all. She is now 100% sure that Suho isn't just like any other hunter, and this could explain why she has felt uneasy since the day she met him. It's his energy that makes him different and gives him a dangerous feeling. Suho makes her snap out of her thoughts and reminds her that he won the battle, and she gives him a different look. Suho then challenges her to fight more and says he has no problem with that. She then tells him it's not a good idea for an amateur like him to fight with her, yet Suho persists and gives her an offer that if he defeats her, she will not disqualify Dong Su. Su Wung now thinks Suho needs to learn a lesson, so she agrees to the fight but warns him again that she will not go easy on him. But this is exactly what Suho wants, he needs a strong battle to fulfill his urge to fight. She starts her attacks to defeat Suho, but his defense seems unbreakable. She then tries everything, from punching to begging, but nothing seems to work on him. She then tells him that she will fulfill one extra wish of his if Suho succeeds in defeating her. She finally succeeds in delivering a small attack, but Suho immediately bounces back at her and breaks her shield. Suho realizes that she is stronger than he thought. He then charges towards her with full intention to end this battle with one final blow, but before that, she stops him and surrenders. This comes as a surprise to Suho because that battle was intense and she was giving him a tough fight, but yet she accepted the defeat. Suung states the reason that the arena is too small for her to completely use her powers, so she is just surrendering. Suho doesn't like this decision, but he respects it. Suung then asks him what's his wish that he wants her to fulfill. Suho then asks her a question, are there other strong female fighters like her on earth? Suung says that there aren't many strong female fighters like her. This is all what Suho wanted to know, and now he demands his wish from her, which is to make babies with him. Suung gets shocked immediately after hearing this, because this is not what she expected. Suho once again explains to her what his wish is. He asks her to get intimate with him so she can give birth to his babies. This makes Suung immediately angry, and she slaps Suho so hard that even Dong Su wakes up from sleep. Suung, after slapping him, leaves in anger. At the same time, Dong Su wakes up and realizes what happened to him. He feels terrible for losing the battle, and now his entrance fees will go in vain. When he sees Suho smiling, he gets more angry because Suho says he's now disqualified. But Suho then calms him down and reveals he's not disqualified. Dong Su doesn't believe this is happening, so he asks him how it happened. 
Suho explains how he managed to stop his disqualification. Dong Su then asks him why he got slapped. Suho doesn't want to answer this question, so he simply tells him that he doesn't need to know. This only further confuses Dong Su, and he comes to the conclusion that Suho took that slap just for him. And this makes Dong Su admire Suho because he saved him. Tears of happiness flow through his eyes, and he decides that he will follow Suho from now on and starts to call him Big Brother. Suddenly an announcement happens that orders Park Suho to reach the supervisory officer as soon as possible for an important matter. Suho doesn't know what is happening, but he still goes to meet the supervisor. Inside the office, the supervisor informs Suho before any discussion that everything spoken to her will be recorded, and Suho doesn't care about it. The supervisor then praises Suho because, in his career, he's never seen an applicant be able to defeat a B-ranked Awakena, and he's shocked by his potential. The supervisor then asks him if he's an irregular. Suho feels confused because this is the second time someone has called him irregular, but he doesn't know what this term means. The supervisor understands his confusion and lack of knowledge, so he decides to enlighten him about necessary information. He then begins to explain about the portal that the Earth is connected to three different planets, Aruka, Gutchen, and Mid-Ur. First is Aruka, which is the home planet of the elves and dwarfs. Aruka and Earth are in a good partnership, and they both help each other and trade with each other. Earthlings who return from this planet learn magic and artifact crafting skills and spread those skills to others. The second planet is Gutchen, which is inhabited by mammons and martial artists, who consistently battle to hold control of it. Martial artists are proven to be allies while mammons became enemies and a major threat to the world. And finally, the last one is Midur, which is a planet ruled by warlike orcs and many other dangerous monsters. They are worse as whenever a Midur portal opens, the situation becomes worse. People who return from this planet after learning skills are classified as irregulars. This information seems complicated to Suho, but he also mentions that the planet he returned from wasn't one of these three. This makes the supervisor think that if Suho is actually from a dungeon, it's very unlikely because he wouldn't have been this strong if that were the case. To get more information, the supervisor asks Suho a question about what planet he returned from. Suho explains he already told everything to the bold doctor, but to put it simply, he lived with wolves for thousands of years. This puts the supervisor in a state of shock, and Suho asks him if he's done because he wants to return to the competition. Supervisor then says to him that he can leave now, and Suho leaves. But Supervisor gets lost in his thoughts about him because his strength is something mysterious. Now Sergeant Kim Sangshik enters the room to meet the Supervisor. The Supervisor, without wasting any time, asks Sangshik to become Supervisor number 15. Sangshik then reminds her that Suung is Supervisor number 15. Supervisor knows it and explains that Suung has run away and now he will need to take her place. He also demands that he closely analyze Park Suho because he is an important applicant. On the other hand, everyone hears an announcement and changes their clothes because the time for the test has arrived. After arriving, Suho and others discover that their supervisor has been changed, and Dong Su feels very happy about it. Kim Sangshik introduces himself as their supervisor and begins explaining important things. He explains that the minimum requirements for today's test are 9 seconds for 100 meters and 1 hour for the tetracontaflin. Some applicants feel nervous about it because their power isn't physics speed and endurance. The test begins, and many applicants fail because of their weak physical skills. Dong Su's turn arrives, and he wishes luck to Suho before taking his test. He completes the 100 meter dash in 8 seconds and qualifies for the next round. Now comes the turn of Suho, and Sangshik is ready to see something crazy. Suho takes his stance to run, and in less than a second, he clears the level. Everyone, including all the applicants and supervisors, and most importantly, the media gets shocked by seeing this. Sangshik immediately calls the head supervisor and informs him about the situation. He also sent him the video of it. The head supervisor asks what's at the media station and discovers they are enjoying very little of it. He immediately sends Suho's videos to bureau officer Miso. After seeing the videos, Miso gets shocked because how can a freak do this? She immediately ordered the removal of all the media from the arena, but it was already too late. The whole internet gets flooded by this news, and then she orders to remove all the articles about Suho and place an embargo. As Suho and Dong Su walk out, everyone storms to take pictures of Suho. An F-ranker broke the records in the very first test, which is big news. At the same time, the Awakena Bureau is worried about him. But they also know that if Suho is actually from a fourth planet, South Korea might get an edge over other countries. Just like this, the Bureau begins to plot dirty politics to use Suho for their own gains. Suho and Dong Su walked into the cafeteria, the chatter and noise of the students immediately dying down as they caught sight of Suho. Everyone's eyes were trained on him, and it was clear that he was the topic of conversation. Suho had recently become incredibly popular in the news, with his fame and success spreading far and wide. 
As they entered the changing room, they were met with an eerie silence. The room was empty, and it was clear that everyone had failed the test except for them. Dongsu felt scared, as it was going to be difficult for only two people to clear the next test. But Suho, being confident and relaxed, tried to ease Dongsu's fear by showing his support and belief in their abilities to overcome the challenge together. Dongsu tried to express his concerns to Suho, explaining that the dungeons were a dangerous place and that they needed to be cautious. However, Suho, with his unshakable self-confidence, brushed off Dongsu's worries. He was determined to take on the challenge and believed that they were more than capable of succeeding. Dongsu couldn't help but admire Suho's fearlessness, but at the same time, he couldn't shake off the feeling of unease. The dungeons were known to be treacherous, and the fact that they were the only ones left made it all the more daunting. Despite his doubts, Dongsu knew that he had to trust Suho. Suho turned to Dongsu and asked him what he had been doing on his phone earlier. Dongsu explained that he had been using YouTube, a platform where people can watch and share videos. But Suho had never heard of it before, and he couldn't believe that such a thing existed. Dongsu was shocked that Suho was unaware of YouTube. He found it hard to believe that his big brother had never heard of the platform. So, he offered to show Suho what YouTube is and how it works, pulling up some videos for him to watch. Dongsu continued to explain the concept of views and subscribers on Suho and how they are used to measure the popularity of a video. As they scrolled through the videos on YouTube, Suho came across one with over a million views. He was amazed and asked Dongsu what kind of video it was. Dongsu explained that it was a mukbang video, a type of video where people film themselves eating large amounts of food while interacting with their audience. He told Suho that these types of videos have been gaining a lot of popularity lately. Suho was intrigued by the concept and expressed that he would like to try it out. Dongsu, seeing the potential in him, promises Suho that he will help him get featured in a mukbang video. Suho thanks him, and Dongsu couldn't help but think that Suho had everything it takes to be a YouTube star, with his tall and handsome appearance and charming personality. Suho then turns to Dongsu and asks him if he would join his clan. At first, Dongsu is hesitant, thinking about the difficulty of starting a brand new clan. But then his past memories of failures flash before his eyes, and he accepts Suho's offer, tears of happiness streaming down his face. He reminds Suho that it takes at least three people to form a clan. Suddenly, a monk enters the room and greets them. The monk introduces himself. The monk then reveals that he is assigned to Team 15. Suddenly, an announcement blares through the speakers, ordering all applicants to change into their battle suits within 30 minutes for a surprise test. Dongsu doesn't like the idea of a surprise test, it makes him feel uneasy and anxious. The supervisor explains that the dungeon they will be entering is a level 1 dungeon with 250 doors and that it is currently under the protection of the Phoenix Guild. Suho doesn't understand the concept of guilds protecting dungeons, but Dongsu explains that after many dungeons started to appear, the South Korean government decided to hire guilds to protect them. Suho can relate to this concept, and he gets excited to acquire the land. The supervisor then explains that the dungeon is not that dangerous and won't have much energy. After the briefing, Dongsu feels demotivated because he doesn't have the search skills, but Suho reveals that he does, which makes Dongsu believe more that Suho is someone special. Dongsu then turns to the monk and asks if he has any awakened skill. This question makes the monk lost in thoughts, and we see a flashback where the monk is sitting inside of a building hitting a bell with a stick and making a loud noise. This sound attracts the monsters nearby, which start to run in the direction of the building. His brother arrives to caution him about the danger in a desperate way. Suddenly, the monsters enter the building and attack his brother right in front of him. This tragic memory seems to have left a really deep impact on Myungjin, as he is left silent. Suho and Dongsu notice the fear on Myungjin's face, and it makes them wonder what could have caused such a reaction. The supervisor ends the presentation and orders them to start the mission, wishing all of them to pass. At the dungeon portal, the group prepares to enter the dungeon. Team 15, which is Suho's team, only has three members, and for this reason Dongsu is concerned. Suho notices this and asks him why he's always so scared. Suho then turns to the supervisor and asks if they are allowed to use their own weapons, and the supervisor reveals they can. The group of 15 then enters the portal, with Suho being the most excited among them. As they explore the dungeon, Dongsu marvels at Suho's confidence. He had never seen anyone so fearless and undeterred by the dangers that lay ahead. Dongsu then shouts to Suho to set up a perimeter. But as he speaks aloud, he quickly realizes his mistake, as his voice draws the attention of nearby monsters. Suddenly a beast lunges at them, Suho steps forward with a fierce determination, and effortlessly crushes the creature. Dongsu hides his error and acts as if it was on purpose that he attracted the monster. They keep walking and as they move forward, the monk accidentally steps on a hidden trigger, activating a trap. 
arrows fly towards them but the monk moves quickly, stands in front of his teammates and takes out his staff. Then we see a flashback where Myungjin recalls his tragic past experiences where he tried to protect his brother from the monsters. He feels a profound guilt for not being able to protect his brother. Back into the dungeon Myungjin counters the trap and saves them. But unfortunately, as they run away Dongsu activates another one, and they all fall down a hole. They are inside the hole and they can hear the noises of the monsters nearby. Dongsu is concerned about the situation they got themselves into. The monk apologizes and reveals that his skill is actually an area of effect taunt, which surprises Dongsu. As the group was trapped in the hole, Suho took a moment to evaluate the situation. With quick thinking, he jumps out of the trap, leaving the monk and Dongsu in shock at his abilities. Suho then confidently invites the monk to join his clan, showing his trust in him. Suddenly, a group of monsters appeared, ready to attack them. Without hesitation, Suho prepares to fight them off. The monk struggles to get out of the trap, but with a determined effort, he finally manages to break free. He then quickly helps Dongsu out of the trap as well. As they stand back to back, ready for the fight, they are amazed by what they see. Suho was effortlessly wiping out an entire army of monsters with his skill and strength. Suho then commands them to follow him and finish off the knockdown monsters. The group moves together and continues to massacre them with his skills and strength. Suddenly, one monster tries to attack him from behind, but Suho quickly notices and evades the attack easily. He then turns around and kills the monster in one swift move. The control team was in disbelief as they received the news that a team had already returned from the dungeon. They couldn't fathom how anyone could complete a dungeon in such a short amount of time, especially considering that it usually takes 5 hours to clear one. Their shock turned to amazement when they found out that it was Team 15, led by Suho, who had accomplished this feat. The control team immediately contacted the supervisor to verify the information, and to their surprise, the supervisor confirmed that Team 5 had indeed completed the task without suffering any major damage. Furthermore, the supervisor revealed that Suho had broken all the records and surpassed the expectations of everyone. Dongsu, inspired by the recent success of their dungeon mission, decides to start a vlogging channel under the name Suho Clan Vlog. He believes it would be a great way to document their adventures and share them with the world so he could become a YouTube star. To kick off the channel, he films a house tour video of Suho's brother's residence. He shoots Granny and the monk to make the video longer. Then Suho's brother returns home, and the group is ecstatic to see him. As they make their way to the dungeon in Suho's brother's truck, Suho's curious nature leads him to spot an autopilot drone flying nearby. He can't help but wonder if he could destroy it with his skills. Dongsu, who is also in the truck, overhears Suho's thoughts and decides to reveal his awakened ability, which is video memory. He tells Suho that he plans to record their first adventure quest and upload it on YouTube to document their journey. When they arrive at the location, they enter the dungeon, and as they explore, they discover it's a bat. Dongsu turns to Suho and asks if he has any long-range abilities that could help them in this situation. Suho, however, admits that he doesn't possess any such skills. Myungjin, the monk, then steps in and tells them that he will handle it. He begins to use his bell, and as the sound gets closer, all the bats become agitated and begin to charge towards them. As the bats get closer, Myungjin uses his fire wheel ability and burns them all. The boss of the dungeon, a giant bat, then tries to attack Myungjin. But Suho steps in and slashes it with his sword, successfully defeating it. And with that, the Suho guild completes their first quest. Dongsu, true to his word, uploads the video on YouTube, and it quickly goes viral. The bureau, which is in charge of monitoring the dungeon's activities, discovers it and becomes worried. The director of the bureau, upon seeing a video of a Russian fighter calling out SS Hunter Akita Hero, decides to confront Suho personally for something important. The next day, Myungjin doesn't show up for work, and Junho reveals that he has gone to live with his surviving family members in Seoul. Dongsu and Junho then suggest to Suho that they take a day break, due to the lack of members and the fact that they have recently made a lot of money. Suho agrees. At the same time, Suho uses his ability to analyze the power of Dongsu and Junho. However, he doesn't see anything special in their abilities until he checks Dog Biku's abilities. He is intrigued by the unique abilities he sees in Dog Biku and decides to investigate more about them. He wonders if dogs can awaken like humans or not. Suho then turns to Junho and asks him about the problem he is facing with his old truck, which is causing him stress. Junho explains the situation to Suho and how it's impacting his daily life. Suho then immediately offers to buy Junho a new truck. Junho is overjoyed and grateful for the offer. Suho also takes Dog Biku with him because he is planning something special for it. They arrive at the dealership to buy a new truck, and the salesman shows them a model called the Kandai Drago. 
Junho is immediately drawn to it, as it is a special truck made specifically for mercenaries like them. The salesman explains the various features of the truck and how it is designed to withstand the demands of their line of work. After listening to the salesman's explanation, Suho turns to Junho and asks him if he wants the Kandai Drago. Junho, without hesitation, says yes and Suho decides to buy it on the spot paying for it in cash. Junho feels an extreme sense of joy after driving the truck, and Suho also praises the comfort of it. However, Suho then drops a bombshell and says that they can awaken today, immediately shocking Junho as he feels a sense of danger. They arrive at the location, and because of the strong smell of goblins, Biku's behavior changes into that of a fierce beast. Suho then steps out of the car and asks Junho to wait as he prepares for the upcoming battle. As Suho and the rest of the Suho Guild continue to make a name for themselves in the dungeon exploring community, their videos on YouTube are garnering more and more attention. Some individuals who are watching the videos begin to worry about Suho's growing popularity and the potential threat it poses to their own interests. One of the individuals asks how many guilds they are funding in Area 4, and another suggests they give assistant manager Choi the job of dealing with Suho as he is strong and had previously destroyed a whole group. They strategize on how to stop the Suho Guild's rise to fame and protect their own interests. Later that evening, as it rains outside, we see Granny Sukja returning from the market. Suddenly, a car stops, and the people from the bureau step out and confirm her identity. They demand to meet Park Suho and ask her questions about him and his whereabouts. Granny Sukja is surprised and worried about the sudden visit. On the other hand, Junho and Biku sit inside the car, waiting for Suho's return. As they wait, an unexpected attack from a monster occurs, causing Junho to be taken aback by the sudden turn of events. Suddenly, Suho returns to the scene and requests for Junho to step out of the car. He then hands Junho a knife and explains that this is an opportunity for him to awaken. Junho feels overwhelmed with fear and uncertainty, not sure if he is capable of completing the task at hand. However, Suho sees the hesitation in Junho's eyes and decides to take matters into his own hands, ordering Biku to bite the monster. But the monster catches Biku, and Suho tells Junho that he must either kill the monster or Biku will die. Junho is torn, tears streaming down his face, but Suho firmly reiterates that this is the only way to save Biku. With great effort, Junho takes the knife and stabs the monster. However, Suho doesn't seem satisfied with just one strike and orders him to do it again. Junho obliges, but as he sees the blood on his hands, he feels an overwhelming sense of sadness and remorse. Suho then orders him to grab the knife and follow him, and to keep killing all the monsters he sees. Junho feels overwhelmed with emotions, struggling to process the gravity of what just happened. The guilt and sadness weigh heavily on him as he follows Suho's orders, unsure if he can continue with this newfound responsibility. As Junho watches Suho walk away, a flood of memories from his past wash over him. He remembers a time when he was getting bullied and Suho didn't help him. This fuels a great feeling of anger and betrayal in Junho. He completes his awakening and attacks a monster. He goes on a rampage, repeatedly stabbing the monster with a sinister look in his eyes. Suho praises his newfound ability and asks him to come to the top so they can clean up the remaining monsters. Junho seems like a completely different person now as he has developed a thirst for blood and violence. Suho and Junho arrive at the mercenary registration office, where the receptionist is taken aback by the sight of Junho's body covered in blood. Suho explains to her that Junho has just recently awakened, and the receptionist nods in understanding. She then informs them that Junho needs to undergo a measurement of his energy before they can evaluate his eligibility to become a mercenary. Junho looks at Suho with confusion, unsure of what this means. Suho, being the experienced one, explains that in order to pass the test, Junho's score needs to be above 100. He also reveals that he himself scored 96 on his last test but failed, adding that it is a difficult test to pass. They enter the measurement room, and Junho lays down on the machine for the measurement. After the measurement, the researcher asks Suho if he would like to take the test as well. Suho agrees to take the test, and as he enters the machine, he feels something terrible and immediately stands up. The researcher expresses surprise at Suho's increased energy, and Suho, with a strong sense of doubt, asks the researcher who made this machine. The researcher reveals that it was made by a scientist, but Suho remains skeptical. Junho completes the test and receives a smartphone as a gift. Suho congratulates him, and Junho is thrilled with his new phone. However, Suho starts to feel like something is off and asks Junho if he felt anything strange while inside the machine. 
Junho, being unaware of any such feeling, denies it. Suho comes to the conclusion that Junho might not be as sensitive as him. Suho then asks Junho about his ability, to which Junho reveals that it is decapitation, the ability to cut off the heads of monsters with a single strike. Suho then spots a familiar face in the crowd, Suung, and calls out to her with the nickname Blondie. Suung recognizes the voice and turns around, along with her colleagues, to see that it is none other than the famous Suho Park. Suho apologizes for what happened in the past but Su Young is unresponsive and tells him that they should never see each other again. She leaves the scene with a sense of anger and disappointment, leaving Suho to reflect on his actions and the past events that led to this confrontation. At the same time, Granny Sukja and Miso are sitting at the dining table, enjoying a meal together. Granny praises Miso for her excellent taste in wine and food. They share a friendly conversation, and Miso wonders where Suho is. Suddenly, Suho and Junho enter the house. Junho's son, who is overjoyed, rushes to hug his father. Suho notices Miso and asks who she is. Miso then sits down with Suho and begins to explain her position as director of the Awakena Bureau. She tells him that she wants him to sign a contract, which Suho is curious about. He inquires about the nature of this contract, and Miso explains that a portal, similar to the one Suho had used to return, will appear soon and be located near his coordinates. She emphasizes the importance of Suho not leaving the country, as it would be a huge loss for Korea. Miso goes on to share the story of the world's number one awakened, Akita Hiro, who was once a Korean named Wang Su but had betrayed the country. Miso expresses her concern that the Bureau does not want to take any chances and wants Suho to stay in Korea. She reveals the country's plan for gaining exclusive access to the fourth planet, which will give them an upper hand. Suho agrees to her proposal but puts forward some demands of his own, such as exclusive territory for his guild. He also asks who will be his agent during this process. The scene then shifts to Suung, who is seen practicing her skills while remembering her interaction with Suho. She is filled with anger and frustration but is interrupted by the director, who reveals that she will be dispatched. Suung expresses her confusion and frustration at being chosen for this mission, questioning Miso as to why she was selected. Miso explains that out of all the members of the Bureau, Suung is the most qualified and capable of handling the task at hand. She goes on to mention that should the portal open in a dangerous situation, Suyoung would be the one responsible for providing assistance to Suho. Suyoung is not pleased with this revelation and expresses her desire to resign from the bureau. Junho, who is a member of Suho's guild, suffers from terrifying nightmares. During lunch, Dongsu, another member of the guild, reveals that they have been promoted and are now able to raid level 2 dungeons. However, Junho suggests that it is too early for them to do so and that they should focus on level 1 dungeons instead. Suho agrees with Junho suggestion. The group is also thrilled to see that their friend and fellow guild member, Myungjin, has returned. Together, they embark on a mission to raid a dungeon. During the raid, Suho unexpectedly runs into an old friend, Yishik. Suho is curious as to why Yishik is alone and not with his own guild. Yishik, however, evades the question and quickly leaves. As Suho's guild continues to raid the dungeon, they are being secretly watched by assistant manager Choi. Ishik, meanwhile, feels guilty for losing core members of his own guild and blames the harsh nature of the job for its demise, as small guilds like his rarely survive. As Suho's guild successfully raids the dungeon, causing a massacre of monsters, Junho proves to be particularly skilled, completely annihilating all creatures in sight. Suho, on the other hand, doesn't do much as he feels the job is too easy. Ishik, who is struggling, wonders if Suho would allow someone like him, a mere E-ranker, to join their guild. Suho and his guild return to the surface after successfully clearing the dungeon and are immediately approached by Choi, the leader of a top 20 clan in the country. Choi expresses his admiration for their achievements and offers them a free ticket to a level 2 dungeon, which is worth a significant amount of money. Dongsu is amazed by this generous offer, but Junho raises concerns about their lack of preparation for such a high-level dungeon. However, Choi assures them that he has already made the necessary preparations and strategies for them to succeed. Suho then tasks his team to continue practicing in level 1 dungeons while he embarks on the level 2 dungeon with Choi's clan. During the car ride, Choi mentions that he would be open to offering the same opportunity to Suho's clan in the future. Finally, they arrive at the location of the level 2 dungeon, ready to tackle the challenge ahead. Choi hands Suho a kit filled with all the necessary equipment, and Suho steps through the portal, with Choi giving him a sly and cunning grin as if he has something nefarious in mind. Just as Suho enters the portal, Suung speeds up on her motorcycle, having been assigned to keep an eye on Suho. 
she approaches Choi and inquires about Suo's whereabouts, to which he informs her that he has just entered the portal. Suung introduces herself as a member of Suho's clan and, without hesitation, follows Suho into the portal. Choi explains to his assistant in great detail about the worth of Suho and his guild members, which is a staggering $2 billion each. Meanwhile, Suung makes her way through the portal and flashbacks to the moment she arrived to meet Suho, only to be told by Junho that he had already left with Suho. Suung feels a great sense of resentment and frustration due to being forced to take on this mission. As she emerges through the portal, her clothes are torn and tattered, leading her to urgently instruct Suho not to turn around and look at her. After a brief moment, Suho curiously asks Suyoung what her purpose is for being here, as Miso had previously mentioned that she would send someone capable. Suung confidently declares that she is the most capable, but their conversation is abruptly interrupted by a monstrous creature that threatens to kill them both. Suung reveals to Suho that the creature they are facing is a boss orc, and it will be difficult to defeat. Suho then informs her that there are at least four boss orcs in the vicinity, leaving Suung confused by the information. Suho tells her that he will take care of all the orcs on his own and that she doesn't have to hunt them as well. After this, Suho wastes no time and begins to attack the orcs, brutally murdering them with precision. Meanwhile, Choi confidently tells someone on the phone to send the money, believing that Suho won't make it out alive. As Suho extracts the blood crystals from the orcs' bodies, Suung arrives and asks for his help. She mentions that it's strange that the portal hasn't opened yet, even after they've killed all the orcs. She also reveals that the backpack Suho received is filled with nothing but stones. It becomes clear to Suyoung that this is not a level 2 dungeon but at least a level 4 one, and Suho has been tricked. At first, Suho feels angry, but his mood quickly changes as he realizes that Choi actually helped him by lying and he becomes excited to take down every single one of the creatures. Suddenly, a monster almost kills Suung, but Suho saves her just in time. Suho boasts about his strength, and just as he does, Suung sees a large group of orcs approaching them. The whole army approaches them, and this makes Suung worry more about the situation. Suung then notices a giant figure in the middle, which is the orc warchief, and suddenly, orc riders start to march towards them, and Suyung realizes it's a full war and not just a normal battle. She is worried about how they are going to win this battle, but Suho doesn't care because of his unmatched trust in his abilities. He again tells Suung not to interfere with his prey because he wants to kill every single one of them with his own hands. They both then start to battle the orcs, and Suung uses her special ability to take them down. Suho's attacks at the same time look more powerful as he kills so many orcs in just a matter of seconds. He dominates every single one of them until the warchief orc decides to take the matter into his own hands and attacks Suho. He makes Suho step back, and Suung tells him about the strength of the warchief. Suho tries to stab the warchief, but it has no effect on him. Meanwhile, Director Miso gets information that Suho and Suyung's smartphone locations are at two different places, which worries her because she believes it shouldn't be possible as they both went inside the portal. The thing that happened here is that Suyung forgot her smartphone on her bike, and Suho too forgot his, which is why they are inside the dungeon without any connection to the outside world. Someone then tells Miso that they are actually in a level 5 dungeon, not a level 2 one, and this comes as shocking to her because level 5 dungeons are so dangerous. Suung and Suho continue their fight to survive against the army of orcs as they struggle to win the battle. Suho then grabs her and starts to run, and she asks him what happened suddenly. Suho reveals that they can't win the battle now and that running is the best option. Suho jumps from the cliff with Suung, and many orcs jump with them. But unlike Orcas, Suho survives, and they all die immediately due to fall damage. Suung too couldn't believe that they survived such a fall. Many Orcs refuse to jump because they don't want to kill themselves. Suho and Suung find shelter inside a cave, where she asks her what they should do next, to which Suho tells her that he needs to kill four more Orcs to level up and then he can take down the Warchief. Suung tells him that leveling up won't increase his strength significantly, so this could be a bad strategy, but Suho doesn't care and only believes in his abilities. At the same time, the news spreads and everyone finds out about this event. The entire media surrounds the portal and begins to report about this matter. Choi gets arrested for causing a conspiracy to kill Suho and betraying the morals and ethics of mercenaries. Suho's guild also begins to worry about Suho, because of course he is inside a level 5 dungeon. At the bureau office, Miso's anxiety skyrockets because of all the mess that has been created. She confronts the director-in-chief regarding this matter and demands help for Suho and Miso. The director explains to her that it's not easy to help them currently as they are stuck in a level 5 dungeon but Miso continues to force him. He then straight up tells her that saving them both isn't the Bureau's priority currently because a lot of things have been going on lately that are far more important. Miso then starts to cry and break down because she finds herself responsible for this as she was the one who sent Suung behind Suho all along. 
During all of this, Suo uses his technique to distract an orc and brutally kill him from behind. He smiles after killing it because he now only needs three more orcs to level up at the same time. Suung also uses her ability to help them survive in this environment. Suo sees an orc and decides to take the shot and kill it. But Suyoung realizes it's nothing more than a trap, but it's too late as Suho falls for the trap and the orcs succeed in trapping him. Suho feels disgusted for falling into such a weak trap, and his anger rises very high, and all the orcs march towards him to attack. Suung uses her strength to stop them, and finally Suho too kills them and levels up. Suho tries to attack the orcs more, but suddenly the warchief orc arrives and smashes Suho and sends him into the distance. He then learns that he has successfully leveled up and can now use various new abilities. He gets an option on whether he wants to use the beast transformation or not, and Suho presses yes. At the same time, Granny Sukja feeds Beat Gun, and she worries about the Suho because it's already been two days. Suddenly, energy generates inside Beat Goo, and Suho transforms. Suung struggles to give a fight to orcs, but Suho completes his transformation by merging with Beat Goo and is now ready to take down every single one of the orcs. He wastes no time and goes straight to attacking with his fierce and wild body. He rips them apart as Suung watches this destruction. In the outside world, three days have passed, and everyone still hopes for an update on this situation because Suho hasn't returned yet. The bureau chief tries to calm the situation by giving an interview but the whole world still waits for something to happen. After Suho successfully kills them all, his transformation fades away, and Suyoung realizes it's not a transformation but rather a fusion. Suho feels a new energy inside of him, and he tells Suung to quickly gather up resources so they could get out of here as soon as possible. Suung, with an empty face, tells him it's all pointless because even after killing so many orcs, the portal hasn't opened, as this could be a sign that they both are going to be stuck here forever and no matter what they do, it will result in nothing. And that's how the first and second part of this manual ends, well guys, if you like this video and you want a third part, comment below with the word plain and also subscribe to the channel, hit the bell and like the video, but most important, leave a comment, until the next video.